compliance with the Pledge of Allegiance and ask Selectman like Clark to lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. That was a trick. You moved the flag, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. We moved the flag for the photo. <laughs> All right, okay. then. I just want to put my phone on stun. silent. On stun, yes. Uh, uh, item one, approval of minutes of September 6, 2018. Motion made. Second. And seconded. Are there any corrections, additions, modifications? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Abstain. That wasn't there. With one abstain. Yep. At this point of the uh, uh, meeting, we uh, encourage people who have new public business, that's business that's not on the agenda, to uh, inform the selectmen of their concerns. Uh, is there anybody here with new public business? Please. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, the board, group schedule, great town meeting member, Precinct 6. Uh, I'm getting a little concerned with the truck traffic on Wenham Street. We've discussed this before, but the proprietor of the Agway does not want trucks turning in his driveway. And as I understand it, where the rail trail used to come through is the actual MBTA right away. And I'm wondering if we couldn't request or somehow have him have his trucks turn in there. In addition to the Agway trucks, now you have Lena's uh, sub shop open, there's produce people, meat people, delivering stuff. And about two weeks ago, there was a Coca-Cola truck that come down Wenham Street, went into Wildwood, and made actually four cuts before he actually get out and turned around on Wenham Street and going back out. It was quite a fiasco with a Coke truck, so just curious if something can be. Uh, out of curiosity, just so I understand your request, did you say that the owner of Agri doesn't want his own trucks turning in his yard or other he, trucks he's turning? He's going to sign out front, please, no truck turning. Okay. Um, like I say, I think that's the MBTA right away. I don't see why. So I, I, I'll, I, yeah, uh, I'll actually ask the town manager to address this because I believe that we had some agreement about the use of the right away. That's that's right. And I think uh, Mr. Gitchell had previously brought up, he, he had inquired about um, perhaps prohibiting truck traffic on Wenham Street, but the, the Agway and the Appliance Center would be grandfathered in, so that would not be an option for the trucks themselves. But the question about uh, the truck traffic in, in turning on that property is something we can certainly follow up with the owners on. There is an agreement between the MBTA and the Agway, and the town is involved in that um, related to the rail trail and the um, and the the arrangement that the Agway has in terms of their their parking is is part of their most of their parking is within the uh, it was in the right of way of the MBTA. So that's certainly something that we can follow up, you know, through the land use department with the Agway on and report back. Yeah, it just seemed to make more sense to turn there to go down into the neighborhoods and turn. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, Mr. Tom Andrew will uh, look into this and report back to us on a future date on, under the uh, items of uh, interest. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Is there anybody else with new business that would like to discuss tonight? No. Agenda item number three, the public hearing will be held on the application of Danvers Car Services, Inc., doing business as Dan Danvers Car Service, Abogani Dahana, Dahani, owner, 19B Hardy Street, Danvers, to license one vehicle not to exceed 13,000 pounds, to travel on all streets in the town of Danvers, to provide transportation on the res reservation basis on only. Hi. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Could you correct me? Abdelghani Dahani. Thank you. Say it right. Could you speak to your application, sir? Well, I, for application here to, um, the transportation from Denver to Boston to the airport, like as a livery. And uh, they said there is some requirement that I have to have a hearing here. Here I am, so. Everything's in Thank you. The clerk has informed me that all your paperwork is in order, and we appreciate you uh, filling it out that way. Um, and this is purely a livery service, correct? Yes, sir. Not a taxi service? No, no. Okay. Um, I'll open up to questions from the board. I'll start with Selectman Clark. No questions, thank you. Selectman Mills? No questions. Selectman Langways? What's a 13,000 pound cap? Is that a van? Is that a limo? Is that a limo <coughs> bus? What is that? It's pretty big, isn't it? 
they say they have to have only one car in my, in my parking. That's the only one I have, it's a Suburban. Oh, it's, it's a, a Suburban? It's just Suburban, yes. It's fit like six passenger, not like 13. Okay. Just one car. And, and you do, other than just airport delivery, you? Yes, people, they, I have a website, people, they okay. request the ride and I pick them wherever they go in. And when he says he just has to register one, does that mean he can have more than one vehicle? Uh, the the the, uh, the clerk has informed me that the weight is based on zoning. Okay, so can he have more than one once we do this? Can he have more than one now? He cannot. He, oh, so each vehicle, he has to tell you how many numbers of vehicles? He, out of that location, as I understand it, uh, uh, talking with the building inspector, he is only allowed one and oh. it cannot exceed 13,000 pounds. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Something better. Nope. Diane asked all the right questions. Thank you. All right. I have no further questions. That's Thank first, right This here. is a yes. public <laughs> hearing, and so we <laughs> offer uh, the opportunity for anybody in the public to ask questions. Is there anybody who would like to speak to this in the public? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Motion made and seconded to close the public hearing. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All in favor? Uh, I'll entertain a motion about the application. Move as uh, presented. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any more questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate Good luck. it. Thank you. Yeah. The board will consider the application of Christopher Sanborn, Director of Natural Resources, to authorize a special permit in accordance with MGL Chapter 90, Section 13, for the operation of hay rides at Endicott Park to be provided by town employees and by use of town vehicles. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, with me tonight, um, I have Christopher Sanborn, from Natural Resource Director from Endicott Park, and I'm David Mountain, Recreation Director. Uh, we come before you tonight asking you to consider our request to authorize a special permit in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 90, Section 13, to operate wagon rides at Endicott Park and other possible locations within the town of Danvers. We are looking to start to do hay rides at the park on Thursday evenings, starting this Thursday from 4 to 6. There will be a pre-registration and cost is $3 per person. The ride will be contained within the park and will also include a campfire and a story hour that we've partnered with the Children's Peabody Institute Library, Children's Library. Um, we've also looked at other opportunities that we have events at the park where we'd like to incorporate the hay rides such as our upcoming open house on October 18th, our pumpkin party, our annual candy cane hunt at the park, possibly Santa by Sea at Pope's Landing where we actually rent a hay wagon right now, um, and in future day, a future truck day or other possible events at Endicott Park. Sometimes there would be a minimal fee, as I stated, this we're starting with a $3 fee for hay rides. Some events there would be no fee and participants would have to have a signed waiver, which we've had approved by town council. And um, this was a purchase in this year's Warren article under the Recreation Division. Uh, we now have um, this beautiful hay wagon that we would like to utilize at the park. So we'll, we'll be here to answer any questions you may have. I'll start with uh, Selectman Mills. Do you have any questions, sir? No, I'm just astonished at the wonderful things, resources that we provide for the citizens of this town. It was this way, not quite as elaborate, when I was a kid growing up here, but we, we do a great job. Thank you for this particular addition to the uh, oh, thank you. to the fun thank resource you. for our people. Thank you. We look at this as a great way to bring more people to the park, yeah. experience the park, have a different experience at the park, um, and provide a great family activity for young and old. Sounds good. I select my language. Um, we had a, got a picture of it. I can't believe I didn't bring it, but it's beautiful. It's I do have some pictures. Would you? Would you? I saw it already. Okay. I but, uh, give anyone it to else? Somebody else who might like to see, see it. pictures I of that. How many? How many kids and fam people can sit in it? We'll take between 20 and 25. It's it's really big, and um, so seeing that you're going to move it off site, so it has to be registered and yes, separately and insured separately, and it comes under a. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And then this money that you're collecting. Which fund will that go into? 
as with all other Endicott Park fees, they're, they're deposited in our Endicott Park, in our revolving fund, in, in the recreation revolving, revolving fund, fund that would um, offset expenses that we incur because we will be staffing the event. And so will we have to, what we've allowed for expenditure on that, will that handle any expenditures you have? Is, is that one of the revolving? I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand the So question. is that one of the revolving accounts that each, each year in the budget we have to approve what you're allowed to No, uh, we have two revolving funds. We okay. have a 53D and a 53E and a half. A 53D was established many decades ago. It's not approved at an annual town meeting. Okay. It is a revolving fund that is an annual reoccurrence. The other one we have that you're speaking to is a revolving fund that is a 53E and a half that does have to be approved each year at town meeting. So this 53D, what else is it used for? Why is uh, it all about right? recreation programs and services that we provide? Mm -hmm. um, the difference, the basic difference is the E and half allows us to pay um, full-time benefits, uh, employees and their benefits. So our child care, it was started because of our child care <coughs> program. So anything related to our child care employees and those programs, that goes through the E and a half. The 53D, which was again established several decades ago, is a revolving fund that all of our recreation programs and fees from Endicott Park go into that and that provide and eventually in the past several years we turned an offset back to the town and damage general fund at the end of the fiscal year. So so okay so what you do is you at year end send back to the general fund you don't buy like like a trailer or something out of that you don't have a committee No the, that the votes fees are to restricted to uh, so let's just say our Falcon summer program mm -hmm. so we collect, we, take, we do registrations on a weekly basis. All those fees go into that account, all of our expenses, all the equipment, all of the supplies, anything related to that park, that program goes into that account. We have a line item for that. And at the end of the year, if we have a balance, we will turn it back to the general fund. If not, we continue a new cycle into the next year. So in general, our programs is money in, money out, but it, it sometimes there is um, excess funds that we turn back to the general fund at the end of the year. Beautiful. Okay. Can I see the pictures there yet? Um, oh, yes, you can see the pictures. So I think this is wonderful, and I appreciate all the extra work, and uh, thank you. That's all I have. You're welcome. Thank you, Selectman Defendant. Thank you. Did uh, the police chief and fire chief weigh in on this? I see where there was a police chief that had an issue with this type of activity in Brewster. We didn't, but when I go on ahead. We didn't directly speak with the, the fire police chief, but we did go through town council, and uh, they made their recommendation. They signed off on the waiver form that would uh, have to be signed off on prior to, and they made the recommendation that the uh, the board issue the special the special permit. Are we leaving them out of the conversation no, they're, they're, for they're, a reason? Yeah, they're they're aware of the purchase and the intent, and there's there's no issue with either uh, police or fire. Thank you. We can't speak to the issue in Brewster, but that that's well, not, I just said you yeah. gave us that information. No, yeah, uh, absolutely understood. I'm just amazed that there's a state law that regulates this to the extent that it did requiring our approval. I never was aware of it, and I've been involved with uh, hay rides in a lot of places. I'm very jealous, Chris. It's a nice, nice vehicle there. It's, it's what I'd like to have done at some point in time, but I can't do it anymore because of development. Um, I think you've got your your uh, request too limited when you inadvertently, Dave, amounts, uh, mentioned Danvers Park possibly for some use down there. I think we might want to just eliminate three words in this uh, request at P Endicott Park and just give you permission to operate hay rides anywhere in the town of Danvers. I think it's a great opportunity, great activity to have, and I don't see why it should be limited to Endicott Park. And you know, I don't want to back you in a corner where you've got to come back and ask for permission to use it somewhere else in town. We would welcome that change. Yeah. So, so I'll be supporting of it, but I want to have the three properties. three words at Endicott Park deleted from this motion, so that any 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 they could have them anywhere in town if they wanted legally, and if they were on the road, they'd have to be registered. But if they're off the road, they're certainly uh, exempt from that. So I would ask the, uh, the town manager or the clerk: Would we have to limit it to town properties? Any town property or? I think, as Bill said, if if it's within Danvers, whether it's on town property, or off town property, different rules will apply, but I don't think we would need to limit it in that way. Okay. Uh, the select would have asked questions I would ask. Um, can I just ask one more? Yes. So on the permission slip here, the waiver, can an aunt sign it? I mean, it, it keeps the parent, but can, can any adult who has the children sign this? Typically it's a parent or a, a legal guardian. Legal guardian at the time? 
So if you've been at the time that you you're you're going to I take my take a ride, sure. The kids I have to get how do I can't take my so I a grandparent wouldn't be able to take their children, their grandchildren? Well, I'm not an attorney, but I don't know if they have um, the legal authority to sign a waiver for them. Typically for all our programs, um, a parent or guardian, a legal guardian signs that document. So um, that's something we can investigate sure. with town council. We need to look into yeah. that because if it's many reasons the kids aren't with, you know, I mean, can a daycare show up with a bunch of these signed? Can No, th so there is a pre-registration process. At least that's where we're starting with pre-registration. So, yeah. uh, but, but in general, I'm not familiar that of anyone can as can sign a waiver for someone someone who's not their child or, or can you find their, that their guardian. Out? Yep, we will look into that. Thank you. Thanks. You may want to check the city of Peabody and how they arrange their hay rides over in uh, uh, Brooksby Farm because they have hay rides there and a lot. And I, I know I, I don't even think they got the, they ever got permission from the city council to do this. They just have them as part of the weddings and or the farm itself for activities. We we did look into talking with them earlier, um, and, yeah. and you may be correct. Any other questions? No, thank you. All right. I'll entertain a motion. So, excuse me, for clarification, are we eliminating the three words at Endicott Park? That's going to be my motion. To make. That's the okay. motion. That's my motion to make, make it as it's presented with the deletion of at Endicott Park. Second. Is motion made and seconded on the motion not to restrict it only to Endicott Park? Any other questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. If I could just say, I will leave these flyers at the door. If anyone uh, would inter interested, they're starting this Thursday at Endicott Park. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sure. Agenda item number five: The board will consider an application of a Change is Simple event at Cell Signaling Technology, Three Trask Lane. Chris Coheen, manager of Fresh Food Catering, for a one-day wine and malt liquor license on Saturday at that location. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm well. Nice to see everybody. Would you introduce yourself for the people at home who don't know who you are? Chris Cohane, founder and owner of Fresh Food Catering. We and Fresh Food Company, as in totality, we manage the 1MT House Fresh Food Cafes and Fresh Food Catering, and now located in Danvers at 10 Garden Street. We just uh, bought a please commissary. Say that again, please. We bought a uh, building at 10 Garden Street in Danvers, so we're moving our headquarters of Fresh Food Catering into Danvers um, probably over the next month or so. So. Wonderful. Uh, would you describe your application in the event? Sure. So um, we are hosting for, I believe, the fourth year in a row, the Change a Simple event at Cell Signaling Technology on the Danvers side, um, hosting basically a nonprofit fundraiser for um, Change a Simple who provides sustainable education to uh, schools and the youth of the North Shore. So what we are asking for is a one-day liquor license to ascertain and, and execute their their uh, fundraiser for the evening. We'll be passing an assortment of durs and um, pouring beer and wine. Is this a public event? Can no. the public go to it? It's a private no. event? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's invited. You can, you can call up and ask, um, but there is a process for um, vetting. We'll okay. say that. Thank you. Uh, Selectman Bennett, would you start? No questions. Selectman Clark? No questions, just an observation. I'm very proud to see you as a third generation of your family in the food industry in Danvers. So you knew my grandfather as and well. My grandfather. At the Highland my Diner. Very well. Yeah, that's great. Yes. And I saw your father's first 500 unit um, catering job at Ray Sullivan's <laughs> house when his major cake collapsed right in the middle of the <laughs> Oh my place. God, he was telling me that story he a few months ago, years old. actually. Before your mother and he were married, and she was one of the waitresses for him. <laughs> great, a great event. We Ice cream cake, and it was like 90 degrees, and yeah, it was melting and melted, topped yeah. all over his tuxedo, oh, right? Oh, that yeah. story? Yeah. <laughs> I, was I hope I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Select the Mills. I think we, uh, a nice uh, dinner that we had last night at the scene. By the way, just a plug at the Danvers Senior Center, one Monday night per month. There is a dinner, and you don't have to be terribly old. Um, <laughs> I mean, I qualify. And it's a great, it is a wonderful, wonderful get-together run by the, our senior center. And Chris and his father are generally in charge of the food. And last night, it was my special request of chicken palm, and they did a wonderful And dinner. we made it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how are the cannolis, right? Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's like my name is. 
Is the, t is the Garden Street any retail at all, or is that just... Not uh, currently, but maybe in the maybe. future. So as of we stand right now, we're just using it as a commissary to do our catering and kind of execute everything that we're doing with our satellite operations, including the tea house. However, um, right now, no retail. But we might be talking in the future. I might be up here for a different reason. You never know. Well, we Next so. year. The food's very healthy. Thank you. That's it for me. And I have no questions either, so I will ask for a motion on the. Uh, uh, move the que the application as presented. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. I will say I was remiss in not asking my standard question, but I know the answer that you are tip certified. So yes, sir. For the record, we knew that. I should have asked it out loud. Yep. All right. So uh, congratulations and good luck. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Nice to see everybody tonight. Agenda item six, the board will consider application by Linda Turcott, event coordinator, to hold a town-wide yard sale in the Elm Street parking lot on Saturday, October 13th, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., rain date, October 14th. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and fellow board members. Um, as, as you said, my name is Linda Turcott. I live at 5 Whitfield Road, and I'm a realtor with Keller Williams in Beverly. Um, in addition to being a full-time real estate agent, I do a lot of charity work and fundraising for various causes, and I wanted to do something to give back to the community where I live. I borrowed the idea of the community at wide yard sale from a few colleagues in Beverly. They've held a citywide yard sale there for the past three years, and it's become quite popular. There were almost 60 homeowners who participated in the Beverly yard sale this past May. I put the idea out on two, two Danvers Facebook pages and the response was incredible. Folks also expressed interest in holding sales twice a year rather than once a year like Beverly. This way people could dispose of their treasures both in the spring and the fall. We had our first yard sale on July 7th. It was at individual homes. We didn't have a central site. Um, it was very well received and drew, drew a lot of yard sale sailors from Danvers and surrounding communities. During the planning process, there were quite a few requests to hold a sale at a central location where people who own condos or live in apartments could participate as well. There wasn't time to properly plan for it for the July sale, but I would like to do it for the October 13 yard sale if possible. The farmer's market location seems like a logical place because of its downtown location, and I hope it would bring people into our local downtown businesses as well. Yard sale participants must be a Danvers resident, a Facebook page has been set up and there are close to 400 followers on the page. Registration is done by an online application form on the Facebook page. Maps will be available online as well as in printed form. I am having professional signs printed at Signorama so they will be uniform throughout the town and will be placed on the homeowner's property a week leading up to the sale. If I receive approval to hold the central location event at the farmer's market, a couple of signs would be placed there as well. I would take responsibility to ensure that all items that do not sell are removed by the owner. As far as the permitting process goes, I spoke to Mr. Collins and offered to coordinate getting the homeowners to complete and sign the applications, and I would return them to, to town hall. Our July sale had almost 20 people participate, and the feedback was very positive after the event. Um, and Selectman Trask, you had expressed interest back in June to possibly include this as part of the Family Festival next year. I think this is a great community event um, to bring people together for a day, and your consideration is very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, Selectman Clark. Uh, no questions. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, Selectman Mills. Um, Linda, do people pay a percentage of their... You know, if, if I sell a radio for ten dollars, how do you get money for the fundraising effort? Oh, it's not. This event isn't actually a fundraiser. I'm just sponsoring it um, as a realtor, um, but the, they don't pay anything. They're they're welcome to donate a portion of their proceeds to maybe like the library that had come oh, up. Okay. This is uh, not a fundraising. No, event. no. This is just an, a community event, letting people you know have their yard sale all on the same day, which is great because it brings in, we, we had a lot of people come like in from out of town. Market without the vegetables. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it starts at um, eight o'clock in the morning. So 
who's responsible for getting the signage up so that no one parks there? Because we do um, have, is that gonna, are we, do we, like the farmer's market, we have a sign that goes up, I think you have to be out by. The sign is up uh, throughout the season and generally we tow if cars aren't out of the lot before a certain time. Um, I don't know that that was discussed, but that would certainly be something we'd have to give consideration to. I because mean, it, because they'd have to be out probably by like 6 a.m. So do we have, can we do that? You Did you ha talk about that at all? No, I so didn't realize you're that. you're gonna get there at six in the morning and the parking lot's gonna be have. What time, what time normally do people have to be out of there? No, no the parking there in that lot. Yeah, okay. you probably have to have a sign up Friday saying no parking Saturday, period, until after two, three o'clock, I mean. You That's have a good point. No, I think the town manager and the town clerk will work with Mrs. Yeah, Turpot. I think you need to. And I think there's also the yeah, 7 a.m. is generally. We could a, we could yeah. adjust. Yeah. People in there and they start up that huge tow truck. That's right. dangerous. We could we could adjust the hours if that's uh, an issue yeah, I just with think the you timing. Need to work that out because there is sure. signage that has to go up. Thank you. I wasn't aware of that, yeah. so thank you for bringing that up. And I and I love this because um, you know I, I thought we had a fee. As they apply for yard sale, I thought there was one in the town. I don't know if you're waving it, and that Stuck again is. Clerk, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Chairman, there is no fee for a yard okay, sale. That's we good. have an application process, and uh, Mrs. Turcott and I, uh, we discussed that, and um, we also send copies of the applications to the police department <coughs> so they are aware and they, they, they can police it for whatever purposes they deem necessary. So, um, um, She's aware of the application process, but there is no fee charged to okay. anybody. We generally allow two, two yard sales <coughs> per household, one in the spring and one in the fall, and it's worked pretty effectively over the course of a number of years. Well, I, I like this better than the individual homes because I'm sick of people leaving <coughs> signs up, so I appreciate that you're gonna monitor those signs and people will take them down. And yes. And I really hate it when they nail them to our new telephone. Yes, I I, I really realize that, and that's that why. Like that. And having them having them uniform, and they'll have stakes that you know yard stakes, so there would there won't be any signs tacked up on telephone poles or anything like that. Yeah, hopefully this will solve a problem that we hear about all the time. Also, a lot of our youth organizations run yard sales to make money, and I think as this moves forward, this is going to be a great thing for them. Your, your youth hockey's your absolutely they all run have started to do that now where the, everybody gets together. And I think it's just a great thing. So thank you for doing this. Oh, you're it's welcome. It's a lot of work, I'm sure, but <laughs> it's better than having I have helped this time out. around. The first time it was, I was by myself. So it's nice to have people step up to help. Yeah, I think you're gonna see some of the youth organizations come forward. We actually had the, the Boy Scouts, or the Scouts had approached us, approached me back in the spring, <coughs> but there wasn't enough time. But they probably wanna do like a can and bottle collection Good. Thank, you. thank you thank you so I really like this idea Linda thank you for bringing it forward and uh, being proactive um, what I appreciate the most is it takes the people stopping in the middle of the street to run over to a yard sale and parking all over the side of the street so that gets that bottleneck off of a lot of our roads so safety wise that's a good idea thank you uh, yes, um, uh, I did reach out to Sturcott uh, previously when she had the original idea. I think it's a great community spirited event. Uh, I did suggest that if they do hold one during the um, end of June to beginning of July time period, the Family Festival would certainly embrace this and put it in our uh, calendar of events and our program books, so on and so forth. Um, I understand from the town clerk that you've had the discussions about what is appropriate signage or not. There was a lot of confusion on Facebook. Not with you, but <laughs> where things can go and where things can't mm -hmm. go, um, uh, and uh, so I'm glad that you know you've uh, you've already cleared that hurdle, uh, and I would expect some enterprising <laughs> scout troop to have a bake sale as well. You know, I, exactly. I think this is an opportunity for others, and a can and bottle drive is excellent. Uh, and fits right into the community theme, <clears throat> so uh, I I'm looking forward to attending. Thank you. So, and th are there any other questions by board members? I'll entertain a motion. Move the motion as written. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good luck. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Don't forget to contact them about getting making sure the lot's cleared. Yes. 
Agenda item number seven, the board will receive an update from the Smith School Project Design Team. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, sure. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself for the people watching at home? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Joe DeSantis. I work for PMA Consultants. We're the owner's project manager for the Smith Elementary School project. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for having me out again. Um, it's been about four months since we were last here. And as I was kind of putting together my speech for today, I was amazed at the progress that we've been able to do, and I'm happy to report it. Try to keep this as quick as possible. Um, but I'd like to start off by thanking Steve and Jen and Lisa and Keith and David and everybody involved in the project. It's been amazing. The amount of prog uh, progress we've been able to make in this short amount of time. It was kind of a cool reflective moment for me this morning. Um, so since we last met, there's been over 20 project meetings. Um, and I'd like to go through some of the major milestones. I'm not going to list each one, but some of the big ones. Um, on May 25th, we voted, uh, the school building committee voted to utilize the construction manager at risk project delivery method. I could speak about that for about an hour, about the pros and cons, I won't. Um, but I'd like to just say that what this allows us to do is to get them on board as soon as next month for what's called pre-construction services. So ultimately, we'll have the company who's going to be building the new Smith School as part of the design team. They'll do cost estimates, design reviews, constructability reviews. They'll have input on student safety, lay down areas. It's fantastic. Um, and again, another um, big reason for that was that it allows us to do what's called early enabling work. And it allows us to bring in the site contractor, the steel contractor before everyone else and get, um, we're going to save, I believe, over a year in construction escalation due to how early we're able to begin construction. Um, so that's one. <laughs> I'll go quicker. Um, Danridge Traffic Advisory Committee meeting on July 26th. Um, TAPE and their team, Howard Stein, Hudson, the traffic engineers, did a great job in advance of communicating with DTAC and Beta Group, I believe, uh, the town's engineers, answering all their questions. And it ended up, um, we left the meeting, and DTAC had no concerns about the project. So we're very happy with that. Um, on August 29th, we received MSBA approval of the feasibility study and their formal authorization to proceed to the schematic design phase. So what that means is the MSBA agrees with TAPE Architects, PMA Consultants, and the Town of Danvers that the proper solution is a new Smith Elementary School, roughly 83,000 square feet on the same site for 465 students. That's the design that the MSBA wants to put their state tax funds into, and they believe it's best for the town. Um, so we're obviously thrilled with that. Um, we received um, OIG approval for the CMR method on September 5th, and then last Wednesday, we actually went through the first process of um, CMR procurement. Um, that's the construction manager at risk that I mentioned first. Um, so last Wednesday, we put out what's called the request for qualifications, and that'll be advertised for three weeks. Um, and then also last Wednesday, the cost estimators were sent the most recent drawings and specifications. They're going to get going on a construction cost estimate. And this is one of the most important phases of the project and elements of the project is this cost estimate. I'll take the information that's received and I'll enter it into what's called the MSBA Form 3011. And what it does is it basically identifies all of the costs that the MSBA will not participate in. And what that Form 3011 and ultimately the cost estimate become is the basis of the funding agreement with the MSBA. So very important. Um, and kind of along those same lines, we received, um, when we last met, our MSBA reimbursement rate was a little bit over 50%. We've actually received 4. Um, yeah, 4.875 incentive points from the MSBA. So they're willing to participate almost 5% additional back to the town of Danvers on eligible costs, which is great. Um, one of those points was for utilization of the construction manager at risk method. The MSBA actually doesn't give that on projects anymore. We were grandfathered in, luckily. Um, so that was great. We got two for green building design, which is either lead or mass chips. Um, sustainable design, which is something that's important anyways. Um, 
and then a whopping 1.875% for maintenance practices out of a maximum of two. I've never seen anyone get two. I've never seen anyone get this many. So that's, you know, kudos to the town and how you maintain your schools and the state is acknowledging that with that 1.875, that's amazing. Um, so that really helps. Um, the last cost estimates that we got, which was in the PSR phase, came in a bit higher than originally anticipated by the town for borrowing purposes. So having this additional um, 4.875 incentive points kind of really helps to offset that. Um, so we'll be submitting schematic design on October 17th to the state. And then we're going to begin, uh, Steve's been on us to really get going with the public meetings, um, which maybe Steve will speak to after. Um, but and in terms of the project schedule, if you want to go to the next slide, it really remains unchanged over, you can't read that, I'm sorry. Uh, it really remains unchanged overall. Um, I won't go into detail. I added some detail on um, construction manager at risk procurement, but ultimately our goal remains that we are still planning for the school to be open uh, September 2021. Uh, Chris uh, is here and the main purpose of today's meeting is to give you a design update. So Chris, you want to uh, trade spots with me? Happy to answer any questions afterwards as well. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, good evening, I'm Chris Blesson from Tape Architects, one of the uh, designers on the project. And so I'll run quickly through design updates. You can hit the first Chris, slide Chris, if you could, could, could you speak as close to the microphone yeah. as? I can. It's hard because I want to look at this slide too. <laughs> um, I'll do this. How's that? Um, so this is the updated site plan that is essentially where we're at right now. Um, it's the building has evolved a bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure where you saw it last, but I know that we have been working hard on just tweaking some of the footprint and inside of the building elements that um, really make up the ed program of the building. And then um, marrying that on the site to some of the uh, ed program that's on the outside of the building. So there's two um, elements that are happening. And so the next slide I think zooms into that a little bit more. And you can start to see um, here, you know, the site comes in and uh, there's the parking lot which is over the existing school uh, will be over the existing school the first phase will be to build the new school building and then they'll do the demolition after that after the kids move into the new school and then finish out the parking lot uh, work there and so um, yeah the site plan is uh, I think pretty straightforward we've we've worked um, I think diligently on getting the bus circulation and the car circulation to work out right, the activities for the kids in the play areas, and um, getting the traffic right for the site, as um, Joe had mentioned uh, before. So, so that's sort of how the building sits on the land. And then I think the next slide is, um, next couple slides are showing the floor plans. And this is the first floor. And to re-familiarize you with the building, it's actually a split level. So. Everything on the right side, um, I'll point to it, you can, from that point over is the entry level. And then the building goes down half a story to what's on the left side of the page. And then there's a second story above the left side of the page, which makes the second story. So you come in at one level and you can go down half a story or up with half a story to get to the different parts of the building. and. Um, and we're pretty excited about the way that works. And so the entry to the building is up towards the top right where the legend is. You can sort of see the build, the entry to the building. Gym is on the bottom. Cafeteria is the blue color on the right. And then arts. And that's sort of the hub of the school, the sort of uh, the, the lobby space, the place that brings the school together for, um, for all the students as they enter and begin their day of learning. And then the classrooms are still organized in a way that encourages breakout learning um, to foster the four C's of um, education of the 21st century and and what's coming. We think that this, this plan is pretty flexible in the sense of allowing the school to operate as they do now or maybe um, reconfigure later into different modes of um, like organizing a school. So so it's, it's a pretty flexible arrangement and it offers uh, I think the most um, access to 
the collaboration and communication and materials that kids need, like right there at their fingertips near, the, near their classrooms. You can go to the second floor. And then here's the second floor. It's the same idea. Um, the only sort of key difference, and, and I didn't mention below, but on the top there's four classrooms. The first floor mirrors that, and on the first floor that's kindergarten. On the second floor that's um, fifth grade. And we've established that the entry into elementary school is a special time for kindergartners, and we want to um, transition them into the building um, in, in, a, in a productive way. And then the fifth graders going out are also transitioning to a new model when they leave. And so separating the fifth graders en enables the building to sort of foster those um, getting ready for the next steps of life and also puts the cohort together um, that sort of models their teaching and, and learning styles the best. Um, and so this is, yeah, this is the second floor and it's pretty straightforward. I think, um, you go to the next slide. So we've done some interior images. I don't know if these have been seen by you all yet. So these are kind of the exciting, um, the money shots, I guess, as, as you might say. These are what kind of spurs the inspiration of what we're thinking and what we've heard from the school, um, but also gets people thinking and excited about what the, the school can be. And this is an image looking um, down towards the classroom wing. So you're on that middle level, that entry level. The, the administration suite is just off to the right. Uh, the teacher um, dining room is off to the left there. And the doors would be, the entry doors to the school would be behind you. So just within a few feet of the building, you get this vista all the way through. And you can see the media center, which is a library, and the steam space down there. and that beyond is sort of this learning stair that connects the two floors together. And there's there's a little kid like in the middle of the image there facing to the left and that's the entry to the gym. And so this lobby space is really trying to bring in a lot of these elements. And, and one of the things that we do, uh, we do focus on a lot in our design before we ever get these security consultants and things on is just the, the ideas around crime prevention through environmental design. And some of the precepts in that are that you want to make a place where you can see where you're going and then when you get there you can see where you came from. And that gives transparency and um, a sort of oversight and accountability to who's in the building and what's going on. And so that's one of the concepts that you can kind of see starting to evolve in this image. This is looking back the other direction and you can kind of see the sort of playfulness that we hope we can bring to this area, both with music, that door um, can open all the way up and create a very big opening so that there can be um, a free flow of um, activity from the music room out. And that creates all kinds of scenarios. You can imagine uh, any kind of um, concert or impromptu displays or performances or anything that you can really imagine. You can just open up these doors, get them out of the way, and let kids come and go in the education to be free. Um, free flowing and also if there's a community event, I think you can utilize these spaces in a real special way too um, inside the building and the space all the way down at the end. This is looking back. So I just mentioned the see where you're going and then when you get there, see where you came from. You can see the door, the entry door and the cafeteria down there um, at the end of this view. This is just a closer look at that transition zone. So this is where you go down seven feet or half a story and then you go up or you go up half a story. And as I sort of noted before, the kindergarten, first and second grade are on the first floor and the third, fourth and fifth grade are on the upper floor. You can go to the next one. And then this is looking back at that view and what's um, called a learning stair. And it's really, an auditorium per se inside of a elementary school and it gives enough space to have probably uh, one to two classrooms worth of kids sitting there and focused on something and so it gives a presentation zone um, for students to happen and that just so happens to look right into the library so you have as a backdrop the media center and those doors can open all the way up too and have some of the, the resources, learning resources spilling out into a pretty collaborative and, and fun space that helps the transition between the building not feel 
like it like it's just a stair and, and it's not connected. So um, go to the next one. Here's a view in one of the learning um, neighborhoods where I think this is on the first floor because the media center is there. And so the left side are um, a bunch of classrooms that are arranged around these breakout spaces where kids can easily come and go from the classroom to do group work or, co or collaborate on different things. And used to, um, in the yesteryear school designs, this would have been full of lockers and only used a certain amount of time a day to pass and go to the next class. Um, but we're really trying to reclaim that space and make it learning um, so that the entire building really becomes um, focused on learning. So you can do that anywhere in this school and break out in any size group that you need to do that and just have access as you go. Um, and then here's the very end of one of those learning, uh, learning corridors or learning neighborhoods that uh, this is the second floor and it's looking out, you know, there's lots of access to nature views and daylight, which is another um, thing that we're putting into design now because uh, the sort of research around having biophilia in design, which is access to nature and, and light, helps outcomes with learning and testing. And so we want to create moments where we give nice views to the outside so, so students can see this, um, this nice picturesque landscape that is around the, the Smith School. It's a nice, um, nice area with lots of trees, and I think it's very, it'd be very nice. Here's that same space just tilted up as an axon so you can kind of see it a little bit better how it fits with all the rest of the um, classrooms. Go to the next slide. And then a look at one of the typical classrooms for, um, for one of the, like I think this is like third or fourth grade. And um, just to look at different ways that we can arrange a room. And you know, um, <clears throat> classrooms really become special when the educators take a hold of them and, and really are um, enabled to do the work that they do well. And these classrooms are made so that part of, and actually part of the MSBA template is that part of the space out in the hallway is considered classroom space. And so we're trying to help the educators understand that you have four walls to teach in, but you also have the many walls and spaces within the building to teach in and not all learners learn the same way. And so maybe branching out into a different space for a day would help learners get different, um, different activities. Um, and then we have some exterior views and I'll go more quickly through these, but this is um, looking at the Smith School from about where the current school is. And um, the entry is just right to the left there and you can see the bus loop and then the car loop that goes off the page there. And um, just trying to get a sort of massing in school that that isn't too imposing, but also inviting and, and get the landscape to work around around just it. Just because I'm yep. so where the the small windows are is that where the current entrance is? About where the trees are in the grass is where the entrance is. Now. Where we have the, the current, entrance on the new building. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the entrance is like right about. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to make sure I have my ducks in the, and so the parking's behind us right now. Yep. Okay. Yep, you can go to the next slide. And so this is a better view of the entry. You can kind of see, you've kind of spun around a little bit and then the entryway there and um, trying to grab uh, daylight into a space. So what's sometimes hard with these plans is they get pretty wide and you can't get daylight to the middle of them, but that's part of that round, in, that corridor in the middle, that lobby space. We've put some clear story windows on it to help get some natural daylight in, which will also help us with our lead points and making a sustainable building. And then this is the field side. So this would be kind of standing on a soccer field, looking back at the building. Um, I believe this is the west side of the building. And so for lead and um, just making the building sustainable and not having too much um, solar gain, you can see we've got some solar devices on there to help control the building and that that's part of what you'll see on this side of the building and that's all i have welcome great thank you uh questions i'll start with Sackman mills any Very questions pretty. <laughs> it looks beautiful no wonder people want to live in danvers <laughs> Sackman so um just a few um my i guess 
now that we're we're going to put the school a little lower and so do, because we're surrounded by wetlands i'm not sure i thought that down there that would get very wet so i'm wondering if we're confident that we're not going to have a problem as we lower down the younger students that that would flood down there so i know that that field back there floods so yeah we've the the lower portion of the building is actually still i think it's around six to eight feet higher than the grade is right now okay um so it's it's substantially higher than what the basement level of the existing smith school is today i didn't know if you were going to dig down because i know that's a very no. wet area yeah well i live in woodville so we're always <laughs> it's always wet and warm. um i also so i have like the original drawing so if we could just get a copy of the the tweaked one that would be really great i'd love yeah, to the, look um, at that so the the team was here back in may and the the general site plan that you reviewed tonight is substantively the same as what was presented back okay. then so, so the, the school building change. committee worked with the design team the first question was do we have other sites in Danvers to look at which we didn't and then it was to evaluate the the site that we have and and we could go all the way back toward the beginning and you can see the wetlands on three corners of the site so one of the things that the school building committee that the bill sits on wrestled with is what's the best orientation for the building on the site and the school building committee determined and the MSBA agreed that that north-south orientation, which sits between the wetlands and retains the existing soccer field, ends up being the best layout um, for the site. So, so the MSBA approved what you see here and really what, what Joe and Chris and uh, Charlie, who is the other architect working on this project, will get into with the school building committee now are all of the details. There's a, you know, as, as mentioned, there have been 25 meetings or so to evaluate everything from technology to security to the building mechanicals to the traffic, um, but a lot of decisions in terms of the um, uh, the plantings and the playground design and the interior design um, have to happen now that the the general concept has been accepted by the MSBA. Um, so, to answer the question you started to ask or you did ask. The, the existing, we have a web page set up for the Smith School project. Um, the presentations that have been made previously are there. This one will also be put there. Uh, now that we're uh, entering into the phase of this project where we want to start aggressively with the public outreach and, the, and educating people about what the sc school building committee has been working on, Joe has a, uh, a marketing person uh, with PMA Consultants that's going to work with us to take a look at our school uh, project website and give us some recommendations for how to make it uh, more relevant and make the information pop a little better. Uh, and we also want to start putting, now that we have some of these incredible visuals for the proposed project, to put some of these poster boards out at the library, at the senior center, in the schools, at town hall, directing people to that website, getting flyers out to start promoting some of these public outreach sessions. Um, and we're talking probably as early as, as late October, trying to schedule the first one at the Smith School. Um, looking at maybe a Saturday morning uh, type workshop that we did in the run-up to the special town meeting for the zoning. Uh, right now, based on the timeline uh, that the team's been working on, we're looking at probably a late January, early, early February special town meeting, um, which means backing up from that, probably a week or two before that, we'd want to do a, a special outreach to town meeting members as we did with the rezoning, invite them in on a Saturday to ask a lot of questions and really get to know the project and the design team. Um, because town meeting is not always the best setting for asking some of those detailed questions, and this will give them a chance to get familiar with the project ahead of time. We thought that worked well on the zoning. So that's where we are with, with the outreach, um, but the, the school building committee is meeting again, I think October 12th or 14th on a Friday, to approve submitting the schematic design to the MSBA, which is the next milestone. Uh, and then by December, we expect to be at the MSBA getting final approval from them on the funding agreement. Um, and since you gave me the opportunity, I'm just going to keep talking for You're another good. minute or two. <laughs> a couple of the things that Joe mentioned at the beginning, um, by, by approving the this, this CM at risk, the construction manager at risk model, and this is something we talked about previously, mm -hmm. we're able to cut about a year off of the, uh, the procurement process, which I think in the, um, it, with the escalation we're seeing on projects is, is, is key for us. Um, the other thing, you know, it, we've not done a CM at risk project before. I did one, uh, we did a, a 40,000 square foot library uh, project in Avon that I was uh, working in a similar role on with the project team. We did CM at risk there and essentially the, the, you're, you're paying a little bit more upfront 
and the construction manager is going to own a lot of the risk associated with site work um, and, and staging, um, that on a site like ours uh, is really key. And with the logistics that will be involved with running the school next to a construction site makes a lot of sense. We're lucky the MSBA grandfathered the town in. And I just want to echo what Joe said about the, um, the maintenance incentives. Uh, so when the, and we have to submit a really detailed report to the MSBA about how we maintain our buildings. And um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's kudos to David and uh, David Lane, Public Works Director is here, I guess since they weren't introduced, and Dr. Dana from the school is also here, but Leif Rockna oversees the buildings division. And we were able to make the case to the MSBA that we do a, a pretty superb job maintaining our buildings to the, and, and as Joe said, we had the highest uh, credit awarded on an MSBA project that he's seen um, in his work. So I think that's, that's going to end up resulting in a, in a lower project cost for the town because we do a good job of maintaining what we have. As was noted, um, the, the, uh, the project budget right now is, is at around $51.7 million. We had been planning for the last couple of years for a $50 million project. We were assuming in our debt modeling a 50% reimbursement rate, so we're at 55%, which we, we expected to be higher than 50, but we wanted to be somewhat conservative. Um, and as we've also discussed right now, the site work is, is kind of the wild card for us because of um, the topography and building it into the slope. It's going to make a lot of sense uh, from a design perspective, but it's um, the, the amount of site work involved in this project will exceed what the MSBA will reimburse us for. So that's something we're, uh, we're working on. Um, but from a timing perspective, you know, the goal, the reason to get the CM on now is that they will be part of the vetting process for looking at the construction costs, which means by the time we go to town meeting, we will have a project budget that has been reviewed, developed by the architect, reviewed by the OPM, and reviewed by the construction manager who will eventually own it, um, which, is a, which I think is a, is a nice, uh, it should give us a level of comfort going into that, into that February town meeting. I think I've completely over answered your question, but those were the points I wanted to make at some point, so now they're out no, there. No, you went over great things. So in, in there, of course, was a lot of your timing, and when I look at the demolition, you know, I was at the Smith School meeting where the neighbors were there and showing their concerns about flow. And so I know it's at, David's going to laugh at me because I want exact timing on this, but it would be great if the parking lot and the building were demolished and put in before the start of a school year. Therefore, we don't have any problem with where they're going to park. That would be great if all of that timed out to happen then. So, <laughs> so part of the biggest advantage of getting the CMR on board. Oh, let me talk to the mic. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. One of the biggest advantages of getting the CMR on board is getting their schedule input as well. I kind of didn't really speak to that as much as I could have, okay. but they'll be able to say, we can build the building in such a way that we can begin this work and we can staff and we can demo. And I can't speak to what they'll say once they're on board, but having them on board and having them throughout the whole design process will definitely accelerate that whole process as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, you know, just listening to the neighbors, and I'm sure, you know, it would be great if everything goes exact, but one of the biggest questions you're going to get asked at every one of these public is, of course, schedule, and you're going to hear that over and over, so um, I think that's important. And, and the perfect thing would be to have that parking lot in place when you open up that school, because now we're not interfering in the neighborhood, if, if that, you know, but that would be wonderful. So speaking of parking as well and, and with the neighborhood, I think it's important to point out the existing Smith Elementary School has, I believe, 45 roughly parking spaces. Yeah. And our design, Tape's design, I, I shouldn't call it right. ours, but uh, shows roughly 124 parking spaces. Mm -hmm. um, the student population is obviously going up and the staff as well. But once the school is fully built out, we are going to have so much extra parking that will alleviate all the traffic on those streets. And that's something that we've really tried to drive home to the neighborhood groups as well. And in fact, we pretty much promised them that, that it would, the, the traffic flow and parking would be better. So right. that's why I'm saying, you know, they're, they're going to take a bigger school, but that was one of the things they asked for. So I'm glad yep, that you're that's absolutely still right. continuing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to ask this next one. So. When I looked at the building, of course, everything for us here in Danvers is security. So it looked like as we walk in the hallway, we're going to be able to lock off back there. So the evening event, so it's going to be a full lock off in the back. Like I love that. Can I just ask your indulgence for one second? I, I was remiss. I did not introduce school superintendent Dr. Dana. Sure. I wanted to do so and offer you the opportunity to just speak to any points of the presentation or anything you wanted us to know. 
Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but that was my mistake, and I apologize. No, that's okay. That's okay. All right. I'm good. This is all the information. All right. And similarly, I should have introduced uh, David Lane, the DPW director. Is there anything, David, you wanted to offer uh, <coughs> before we go on? Oh, good. You're doing a great job. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, was, I wanted That's to correct okay. my error. That's okay. You know I have a list. So I also noticed that unlike the other elementary schools, we're moving lock, we're, we're moving the lockers inside. We're back to that like we were. So that's gone back and we're not. So the hallways are going to be totally used. I didn't see my whiteboards up in that hallway, which I really love that the corporate people are doing and I hope we see some um, whiteboards or whatever up there. I missed them? Yeah. Okay. We can show you another. That's all right. I just, you know, it's <laughs> those breakout areas, uh, what corporate's doing, I love that we're doing it in the schools. I mean, wasted space, you know, is just a waste of money. So I love that. I noticed that on the <coughs> windows here, unlike the high school and the middle school, we had to put snow breakers up on the windows. They would call something the the grills on the outside of our windows so that ice and that coming down, I believe it was, to break up the snow. We have it on the middle school and the high school. Well, on the middle school. So actually we have snow breaks on that on the round roof over the gym. Those are sunshades. Okay. Those are actually, and they're set at a certain angle to deflect the sun to cool off the back of that building. Okay. So if you'll see on the west side, Chris snow. showed on the west side of this building, we also have some sunshades and an overhang on that side. I always thought those were to break up the snow. So that Yeah, no, those are sunshades. I don't always listen to everything, but I get half the story <laughs> right. Um, I, I love that you're using our wetlands as a visual. Um, again, something that, you know, our CONCOM takes great pride in. Um, I also laughed when you were talking about the points because I do JetBlue points, David does MSBA points. It's like a battle for him. It was so much fun watching him get green points. But so now, if instead of 55.08, we're at like 55.15 because we've gone from four and a half incentive points to 4.875 already. And in this, so that's pretty much what we're comfortable that we're going to get. Are there, is there any chance, are there any points out there that we're going to be going for that right at this point we can't include? At this point in time, it doesn't appear to be so. Um, but I just, sh I should really point out that that reimbursement rate is percentage of eligible costs. So a lot of the time it's easy to say, you know, the MSBA is reimbursing 55% of the project. They're reimbursing 55% of what eligible they, project costs. It's just an important clarification I'd like to make. Have they included demolition now? They didn't yeah. before. Oh, so that's new. Now they're doing demolition. Yeah. So that's good. Let's go back and do the high school. <laughs> Save a little money. That's great. Is there any other changes to what they're allowing from the high school that we're going to see, David, besides what they will reimburse us? Because like the gym, I'm assuming, yes, because we'll be under the square footage. Yeah, no. They, the, Mr. Bartha mentioned the biggest thing is, is that the MSP is still very tight on site work. Yeah. And, and talking to the professionals here, it seems like all the school projects no one can stay within the site work budget. And so this one, we're going to be not get 55% of all the site work costs. So we're disappointed at that. Obviously, we've made our comments known, and they do all the time. So that's about the same as it was at the high school. But we picked up demolition, so that's a little something. OK, thank you. Um, and I should also point out, the MSBA does pay for what's called the uh, commissioning agent, and they handle those costs completely. They That's not. It's not 55% of those. They do that 100%. So that's also worth kind of pointing out. I'm a little ahead on the budget, but just saw some things. Um, and I'd like to put in for early January. Can we not do it in February? <laughs> Can we push this for early, for, I mean, for late January? Anything January would be much nicer for me. So just, just that. So if we can get the parking lot in before school starts and have the town meeting in January, it would definitely accommodate. You're asking the wrong guys. <laughs> Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Just like when Bennett calls. Thank you. Um, <laughs> my golf can I ask David Lane a question? David, what was the percentage we got for maintenance practices with the high school? We were just at right around 1.5, 1.6. It was 1.5, 1, 5, 1 yeah. and a half, yeah. We had to scream and yell a bit to get that, but... You know, we thought we should have got two, but we got We there. still think we should get so, two. Yeah, I know, course, yeah. Like, see, we're very pleased. Yeah, but kudos to the staff. And, yeah. Yeah. But what did you do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> a 
I'm going to find out. We'll turn over every rock and figure I actually, that one out. I, mean, I, I, would, I would think it was probably completing the high school project and coming to see, you know, you could eat off the floor in the boiler room in that high school. And I think in, in evaluating the Smith School project, one of the things working against us was that the, the DPW did a great job keeping that building functional as the metal panels were corroding and the, and, and the, uh, the, the building was you know, in, in need of these repairs, we were making those repairs. So the project, the building looked better than it really was. Um, and I think it's, it, they're, they're recognizing that. that you know, they don't Great. want to penalize us for, for having good practices in place. So um, when we had the uh, DTAC meeting, we had a lot of concerns for the neighbors about the traffic, I mean the kids walking from the cars to the school between the buses. How did you address those concerns? Well, I actually meant to mention this earlier as one of my kind of main points, but um, what we had a building committee meeting where this was discussed as well, and one of the members suggested, um, similar to your rail trail in town, kind of the plot, the plateau, excuse me, plateau raised crosswalk with the illuminated sign. Um, Chris, I'll let you speak to kind of the, the drop off area. Sorry. So yeah, it's. It's now got the, it's still got the separate fire, um, fire lane and bus lane from the cars. And so those two things are separate still, but um, I'll point to this zone right here has, uh, it's, it's in a lot of places they're called speed tables. Um, and it's basically a wide elevated zone that's for pedestrians. And so the buses will go up and over that as they come through, which it really is a good traffic calming measure and a safety mechanism. And I think it's also going to be um, signed. Um, is yeah. it going to be signed? Yeah. So there's going to be signs there and striped. So it's, it's a pedestrian zone. And so that, I think, helps alleviate some of those concerns. Chris, it was important. The island in between, they, we narrowed that up. Narrowed, yeah. So it's a yeah. shorter walkway across that island for the kids. And also that pulls, makes more of a buffer yeah. between the houses. So we've got this down it as narrow as it can be designed. Because there's topography. Sorry, there's there's a little bit of grade change in there, too, so you need it to be. And something Keith would say if he was here is that they're committed to providing additional staffing at pickup and drop-off time to maximize safety, especially at first, but that they're fully anticipating um, providing additional staffing with teachers. Yeah, we, we did hear that, but I think yep. above and beyond, I'm glad you did something for a pedestrian way for the kids to utilize and stay in. I'm glad you asked that question because I meant to give the school building committee uh, props earlier in my presentation and I'm glad I had the opportunity to. So the last thing as far as pedestrians was the sidewalks up Laveo. And we noticed we're missing yeah. some sidewalks up by the, the south end of Arisha. So the project will get the sidewalks up to the property line and then we'll look to DPW and the, our ongoing paper management program to get, continue the sidewalks up, a good crosswalk at, at Aracia, continue sidewalks up Aracia. So we've talked to the neighbors and the parents about we're gonna need some DPW involvement to connect the sidewalks on this side, especially where the school is moving so far this way. We're expecting to have students, maybe parents, walking up La Bayo that way. Great, thank you. continue with sidewalks after the project's done. Yeah, hopefully that will alleviate some of the concerns or most of the concerns of those, the neighbors in that area. It will help, good, thank you. So my comment is, um, looking at the pictures, uh, the hallways, it looks like an airport terminal. The wide aisles and things off to the side, it's like where's Dunkin' Donuts, where's Starbucks? Um, that's my comment, it looks like an airport terminal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, that's all. Thank you, Senator Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's been a great, interesting time for me to be on this committee. This is the fourth building committee that I've been on in my educational career going back to the 1960s up in Topsfield. And uh, this, this team we have of designers, I think, are very, very astute in their multi-use aspects of the building. I was very impressed with that. I've asked questions about traffic and other things, parking, et cetera. Every question has been answered. To, to Dan's comment about the wide hallways, those are going to be supplemental learning areas as well as along that hallway, rather than just having a, a sterile hallway that has nothing but lockers and uh, asphalt tiles, it's going to be used a lot more. And I know David has had a, a lot of comments about the floor surfaces and stuff like that, but I think one of the big things besides this design team that's working here now, we have with, with Lisa and Dave, we have people that have now done 
four schools together, I think, or three schools at least, from start to finish. And they're not naive individuals as they were possibly 15 years ago. I mean, as far as school construction goes, they've, they've faced an awful lot of stuff. And I, I happened to have sat on the committee when they were designing the original Smith School with the Dunwing of the high school, and it was the largest company in America, Caudrell, Rollett, and Scott, that did the design for it. And they had no conception or no, or, or no appreciation for New England, number one, and for differing learning styles was another interesting situation. And, and the original Smith School was certainly a, uh, an example of a unique educational style that was very popular or was trying to be popular in the 70s. And it was a total, I think, failure, personally. But um, when we've had to live with it for 30, 40, 50 years. This, this team is really sharp. They've made some very, I think, astute points. They've taken a lot of input from the community. Certainly some of the members on this committee that we have are certainly talking for the neighbors in a big way, making all kinds of conversation and, and, and requests. And um, I think they've done a great job fitting, first of all, this size facility in that small piece because there's not an awful lot of wiggle room there. And um, I think it's going to be a, as good a possibility for that use of that land as we possibly could do. I, I was amazed that we didn't have to go to a, um, a budding landowner and take some more land to get enough space to have enough area for the school. And I'm very pleased that they said there's going to be enough parking in the school, unlike the Highlands <coughs> and the Riverside School, both of which are on main thoroughfares, both of which way underestimated the amount of parking they needed. And they're well aware, and, and Lisa's explained the number of staffing that's going to be in this building, and there's plenty of parking once the lot is finished. Um, I'm not as concerned as some people have been about the kids crossing over that area because the point was made, I think, uh, repeatedly that, number one, all those bus drivers are professional drivers. They're very careful about how they use their vehicles, and it's going to be kind of in a real controlled area. And one of the comments that one person suggested, and I think it might be an, a great idea, and if we can't afford it, maybe the Smith School parents could buy it, would be those flashing lights like they have at the crosswalks for the real trails because when the kids cross that one location, that would give the buses a little bit more warning that there's, there's people there doing that. It may not work out as well, but it's, it's an idea that was thought about, talked about, and uh, I'm very impressed with the committee, and I'm very, very impressed with these people from the architectural firm. And our, our method of construction, I think, is going to get squeezed in with this very active climate of building. It's, it's escalating very rapidly right now. Hopefully, we can beat the rush for um, contractors to get people available for the job. And I wish you guys luck, and I think we're in good hands, really. And I thank you guys for appointing me in this committee because I had been stymied since I've been a selectman not being able to get on one of these building committees. And I, I chomp at the bit at this. It's, it's very stimulating it, mentally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. One is uh, we talked about the fact that the lockers have moved out of the hallways. Where do uh, where are the students going to have space for their personal belongings? Coats, backpacks, between yeah. classes. So Joe will, yeah, it's in the classroom. Joe's going to pull up the, um, it, it, they still have, a, it's basically a cubby inside or locker inside um, the yeah. space. And you can see it here. Oh, I see it. And so it, it essentially gives them a place to hang their belongings and then also like a paper slot or a computer spot if they all have one-to-one -one devices or something. So is the concept that the students will stay primarily in a classroom, like a homeroom, or is it they'll tr transition between different classes for disciplines? Yeah. Yeah, so do the disciplines move or do the students move? For the K-4, they are in a homeroom. They'll have their homeroom teacher like they do today. But the flexibility, that was really part of the visioning work that we also did throughout this project, um, the flexibility between the classrooms. So let's say the, the four kindergarten classrooms and being able to be out into the hallway also, they'll be working together that we're not confined to those four walls. Um, and we're hoping there'll be co-teaching happening. When our students um, come to fifth grade, they do begin to transition um, between right now, usually two teachers, three teachers um, at our school. So one teacher is responsible for math, another teacher responsible for the English language arts, and usually sharing the science and the social studies. And that's a preparation for the additional content and getting ready for middle school. Thank you. Selectman Clark offered uh, a solution, a potential solution for the crosswalk issues. 
I'll tell you there's a low tech solution. I drive through several uh, towns and I have seen at the crosswalks they have flags. On each side of the crosswalk they have a PVC pipe and in it red flags and the students and the, and the and parents take a flag to help people be aware that they're crossing the crosswalk to the other side. Um, and uh, that might be another low tech solution as opposed to, to the flashing, but I'm not opposed to the other. The other. Um, I think that is all the questions I have. I know that we'll be scheduling quite a number of public hearings. So, uh, so uh, Mr. Tom, yeah, one, one small but important point I wanted to, to reference is that um, in the site redesign, what we lose is the existing uh, Memorial Pope's Playground. But David Mountain has already reached out to the family to ensure that um, what gets incorporated into the final design will be um, reflective and representative of what they would wish as well. So that, uh, that playground gets, will be relocated, the playground will have to be relocated as part of the project, but the, David is reaching out to the family uh, right now to make sure that they are involved with this process as well. Thank you. Any other comments from board members based on questions or comments from members? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dana. Thank you, David Lane. We appreciate um, the information. <clears throat> The board is requested to consider a reappointment to the Danvers Housing Author uh, Authority Board. This was an item that was tabled uh, last meeting uh, and uh, to be brought back with some uh, further details. Mr. Tom Manager. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, after our last meeting, I had a conversation with Susan Fletcher, um, who had a discussion with the executive director for the authority. Um, the question that the board asked was whether she was recommending the reappointment of the fifth member and um, the request is that we table this for one more meeting. They have a meeting scheduled for later this week, and that was a question that she wanted to take back to her board rather than um, make, because ultimately it's it's uh, it's their will and not hers. So she's going to have the discussion with them this week, and I expect to be able to bring um, some some guidance back from her uh, at our uh, first October meeting. So as this is already tabled, I think we'll just continue that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Tom Andrew will report to the board on various items of interest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, several items. Um, first, a reminder that uh, there is a, a hearing scheduled tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at the police station related to the, uh, uh, the uh, nuisance or dangerous dog incident that occurred earlier this summer. Um, uh, the police chief and town council will be present to, to run the meeting. Um, notifications have gone out to all interested parties and, and it's been advertised. So that will be 6 o'clock tomorrow night um, at the new training room at the police station. Um, a couple of, uh, actually another, uh, also in the, in the police training room, I forwarded an email to you all uh, earlier this evening. Um, we'll be having a, uh, a ceremony next Thursday, the 27th at 6 p.m. Um, to recognize Steve Baldessari, who was selected as the VFW uh, Massachusetts Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. Um, so, and, and he is in the running for the national award, um, but a, a decision has not yet been made on that. Uh, but we will be having an event open to the public uh, next Thursday at 6 at the police station uh, to honor uh, Officer Baldessari. Uh, a couple of quick personnel updates. Um, I had mentioned at our last meeting that we had, uh, we were, we've been very busy on the recruitment front. Um, we did get our uh, backgrounds cleared today for the final member of the planning department. Uh, we have an individual, uh, his name is David Fields. He worked uh, for Aaron in Lexington and when Aaron came to Danvers, uh, uh, David applied to, to rejoin his team, so he will be starting uh, in early October and joining Aaron Schaefer, uh, who came to us from the city of Salem. Uh, and so uh, Aaron and David will be joining Aaron with an A, and this is causing lots of problems already in the building, having two people in the planning division named Aaron, um, and of course Sue Fletcher, uh, who is the, the senior member of that team. And uh, we're expecting big things from this group, uh, starting with the C1C1A, uh, effort that we discussed uh, with, with the three boards uh, prior to our last meeting. Also on the personnel front, um, I, I conducted a final interview on Friday um, with our, the top candidate for our finance director position. Um, he has accepted uh, the offer um, and once, uh, once the backgrounds are uh, complete, uh, I will be uh, eager to announce um, that appointment. Uh, we're anticipating a mid-October start date which works pretty well timing-wise. Uh, he'll, uh, he'll be on, on board before the closeout of the audit, so he'll be able to participate in the audit um, and well in advance of the budget. Um, so uh, I'm told Travis is doing well uh, down at the MWRA, but we're, we're excited to, uh, 
to have landed our top choice uh, for the replacement. Um, a quick update on the recent events up in uh, Andover, North Andover, and Lawrence. Um, we did have, uh, I, was, I was in talks with Chief Pyburn the, the, the night that this was happening. We did send equipment up and personnel the night of. Um, they were there uh, through the night assisting. Uh, we also had a request um, that was uh, uh, processed through Public Works to send up any um, shelter-related uh, materials that we had on hand. So we had a, a group from the Buildings Division send up some materials to support the night of. Um, we had offered uh, to send up inspectors or food or open a shelter if necessary, but they've, um, I think the response has been pretty overwhelming. Um, and uh, I, won't, I won't repeat anything that's already out there in the news in terms of where they are with the recovery, but um, we did, you know, we, I, I think it's been recognized that Danvers received a lot of help when we went through a similar situation in 2006. So we were eager to, to be able to, to help in some small way uh, for, the, for our neighbors uh, to the north. Um, Last item, just briefly, we, uh, we're wrapping up the uh, classification and compensation study that was conducted this year through a combination of a small appropriation and a grant that the town received um, to look at uh, the 60 non-union positions that we have in town. The last time this was really done was uh, in the early 2000s, so it's been about 15 years since, uh, since we had a, a, an outside consultant come in and do an evaluation of those positions. Um, so we're a little bit delayed in the uh, management <coughs> compensation plan that we do annually, uh, where I, I, I bring the evaluation uh, findings for, for members of the management team for this board to adopt. Um, we'll have a sit down with, the, uh, with staff in early October. So I'm anticipating that the October 16th meeting uh, is when we'll be able to get the materials out to you all uh, for that annual uh, process. So. If I might, does that survey include, does the 60 non-union positions include the people within the schools or outside It's separate the from schools? the schools. Thank so you. this is separate from the schools and separate from the library. This would be all of the uh, uh, department heads, division heads, assistant uh, division, so we, you know, the assistant town clerk, the assistant recreation director, as well as all of the non-union um, confidential employees, such as my uh, executive assistant for me, for, for David Lane. Uh, the, these are folks who, um, have jobs that are confidential in nature, so they don't belong in a union or not represented by a union, but, um, and therefore, uh, you know, it, was, it seemed it was a good time to, because we received this grant, that we were able to do a proper uh, compensation classification study. And there may be some adjustments to get recommended out of this, either in, in the budget process this year based on market analysis um, or changes in job duties and responsibilities. But I think it's important that we have a, an updated um, analysis of all these positions, because it has been a while. Some of the positions here didn't exist in the early 2000s, so it's, I think it was timely. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Right. Any questions for the town manager on his report? If not, so the, the, new, the an new analysis that you'll be getting, does that include the, um, is that something that would involve the new pay, pay equity study that came out of the state a few years ago? I mean, is it? It, it does in the sense that, you know, these positions, you know, we're, we're comparing our employees to uh, two, there are two metrics that are used. One is ERI, and I, uh, that's an acronym for something I'm not going to come up with off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a database that HR professionals have access to, and it looks at what the market is for a particular position with particular years of service. And then we have 17 benchmark communities that are similar to us in, in size and economics and uh, government structure. And so, We'll be able to plot our existing positions against what the market says that position is. So, it's not a pay equity specific analysis, but it certainly will be relevant and valid through that lens because we'll be able to target. So they still haven't brought in the um, equal pay, equal work type thing. It's more of an analysis of, is it to other positions of equal. And for these, for these. For these positions, we only have one, so we don't have two assistant. We don't have two town engineers, right. so we can't. If, if in, in, in the example you're using, if you had a male and a female employee doing the exact same job, um, then it would it would absolutely come in. Right. Well, but in a, in yeah, the unionized okay, environment, that's not yeah. an issue because we have a very rigid step and uh, grade and step plan. Yeah, it's so, not female male. It's, right. It's. Equal. But the market data is is blind to that, so we'll get an analysis of Hopefully what the market. Hopefully, that will yeah. catch up someday. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions for the town manager? I'll accept a uh, motion on the consent calendar. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
This time we'll go to correspondence, select my new business, previous put new public business updates, and select news closing comments. I'll start with you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Trask. <clears throat> I had a resident of Maple Street approach me a couple times in the last month, and I went over to see his front yard. He has a concern. There's been a new fire hydrant placed in front of it. This is now north of Bayberry uh, on Maple Street as you're coming up the hill from down by Forest Street. There was a new fire hydrant put in there several months ago, and according to this gentleman, it's been wiped out three times since then. There's also some sort of a solar station, monitoring station that's right there that is very susceptible to being hit. His concern is that the guardrail rail that was put up was very insufficient, and um, we need to look at that, address it, basically. Now, I know for a fact that back when I was teaching, there was an accident right there where kids came up around that corner went airborne right across Bayberry, and one of the boys ended up being a quadriplegic as a result of it. It was one of many accidents we had with the lower drinking age, et cetera, back in probably the 70s. But that, that corner seems to attract a lot. It's got a lot of, a lot of traffic going up Maple Street. Um, these additions to the side of the street are put in an, almost a, an area that's, if you keep on going straight up the hill, you're going to hit them. If you don't start making that corner correctly, um, you're gonna you just you didn't go into them and he feels that the guardrail wasn't wasn't put up long enough It was only a very short distance and, it's, and it's, if you look at, at it today It's just wiped out totally and the hydrant isn't even there. It's been, it's been cut off and it's not even servicing so with um, 20 new houses going in in that neighborhood and Increased traffic that we have on Maple Street. I think it's something we ought to look at it's um It could be dangerous. He's, he's had three cars end up in his driveway in his front lawn the last one had the engine torn right out of it and was uh, separate from the car, and uh, people were hurt. Uh, you don't you don't put those kind of obstacles in the way of traffic, or you at least try to make some sort of an amendment to keep the cars on the road and away from that type of thing. So I think it's something we should uh, they should be looking at and addressing. Maybe David could take a look at it with the traffic or Pat Ambrose or whatever. That's it. Thank you, Slackman like Mills. Uh, <clears throat> just want to repeat that the. Uh, I think there are a lot of wonderful things available for citizens in our community of whatever age. And every time I look at the recreation book, I don't know if we publish it once a year or twice a year. It just is <coughs> amazing. And I'm wondering if we sufficiently publicize the availability of resources to people. Now, I'll just bring up again, and um, especially to a couple of my friends in this room, we have this delightful supper once a week, down at the, uh, once a month down at the senior center. The only way I knew about it was because I think <coughs> Bill Nicholson told me that he bought me a ticket, you know, five dinners ago and said, you know, come and join me. It's something um, kind of, I'll buy a couple tickets for Bruce and, and Bill for the next one. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing, and I'd like people to know, especially, I guess you do have to be a male um, to go to the men's dinner. Um, Bill, didn't you come to one? No, I haven't been there yet. One, because no. you keep blaming it on the rolling seats. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, and, and Dan, Dan, Dan you're old enough. Dan, yeah. you're old enough to come. So, in any event, <clears throat> I just want people to know that's one of the wonderful things that's uh, available to um, make you feel at home in this town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langlis. Um, really, haven't done much, but we did take a great um, walk. Um, with uh, Steve King and Aaron, I uh, just Henry, um, and uh, Senator Lovely, Rep. Speliotis, Dan Bennett joined us. We walked the um, Middleton line, or what do we call them that? West line, West line, I believe it is, and it's uh, it was quite productive. Um, really, you know, just getting an idea of what the obstacles were. But I did want to thank our town employees. They did a great job of explaining. You know, we do have a state area of that, so it's important that we start talking to the state at this point. And uh, Aaron's only been with us a few weeks, and thank God he was on the planning board because uh, he knew just about everything there was about the rail trail, so I was quite impressed with that. Um, I did the email that they. Uh, Town manager sent out to Andover, North Andover, Lawrence. It was a little, you know, just another one of those things as tragedy happens, 
we learn from it, we do better the next time. And seeing what he included in there, offering inspectors, you don't think of that because that gets people back in their homes. Our, our, uh, our cafeteria is to cook meals. Um, of course, our fire department was there that evening, and I believe our police department was too. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure from this tragedy, um, one of the great, one of the only good things that happened probably from 9-11 is that we now communicate. It's no longer the fire does this or Danvers does this, Beverly does this, or FBI does this and somebody else does that. And so I believe they had if something like 200 fire apparatus there within hours and coming from New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So um, I do hope that once this calms down that when our first responders meet and they do brief on that, that they don't hesitate to come back to us and tell us something more that they're going to need. My favorite money that we spend in this town uh, is uh, sending them to classes that we hopefully never will have to use. So um, I do believe in learning from something. We can't be perfect, but it was a great example of how fast. And Gardner, you had a note out, but our town manager had something to them very quickly of what we had available and that was that's really what they need it's so that when something comes up so I think we're doing better I think it you know tragedy is an awful thing and um, you can't take back you know a little 18 year old boy having a chimney fall on him no matter how great things happened a family was destroyed so we always want to learn from these, and again, I do hope that they come back to us and tell us if there's something more, so that if it ever happened in Danvers, it would be ready also. So thank you. Thank you. I have a, uh, I get the same correspondence most of us have in emails, although I did get a couple of comments uh, independent of that, and uh, I'll pass them on to the town manager. There's a growing concern about crosswalk violations, that is people stopping for people in the crosswalks or not or even though when they do, people passing them on the right. Um, I'm sure the, the police patrol that as much as anything else, and I'm not suggesting that they, they, they're lacking in diligence there, but if you could speak to the police chief and, and let him know there's a heightened awareness of this, and maybe some enforcement, uh, some uh, visible enforcement might be a good learning opportunity. You're talking about cars not respecting pedestrians in crosswalks yes. or yes. pedestrians crossing mid-block, mid because nope. I see I'm, both downtown I understand. Both, I'm not yeah. talking about a jaywalking yep. I'm talking yep. about people waiting in the crosswalk or even yep. crossing the crosswalk and cars blowing right by yep. them um, so uh, and not respecting the fact that a pedestrian in a crosswalk has the right of way um, so if you could a a ask the police chief to, to make that a uh, um, to have a heightened awareness of that because it's it's I've received three different emails or phone calls can I add to that, Gardner, please? please? please. Uh, tell them they might want to look at the uh, crosswalk between Cherry and School Street. Uh, primarily the com comments I got were down to in the downtown yeah. area. They, um, they don't stop for people in yeah. that crosswalk. Uh, and as well as the one on Maple Street after the uh, leaving town after the curve for um, uh, summer. Uh, there's a crosswalk a little bit further up. Um, and a lot of people uh, use that and seem to have to wait an inordinate amount of time for people who, who don't stop or respect the law. Sure. Could I just add one thing? I just, when you admit that, is it, it hit something with me. I was going northbound on Route 1 the other morning. School bus is in front of me. School bus puts on its lights, starts to stop. A JRM trash truck blows right by it. This is about the, one of the uh, 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 trailer parks, Grado, uh, the Shady Oak Trail Trailer Park, and two cars. I could not believe these people didn't stop for the school bus, but the JRM trash truck is very obvious. They were pulling out of their terminal, and they were going northbound. They just went right by that bus, and that, that's a fundamental. And I know it's a real complaint with school bus drivers all over town because I have coffee with some of them in the morning, and they're always complaining about people that don't stop for them when they stop with their red lights on. Um, and I think that the owner of JRM ought to be uh, made aware of the fact they've got a driver this very, very careless going up northbound Route 1 at about quarter of 7 in the morning. Going to Dan's neighborhood to do their <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, they've already you. been there. <laughs> the other um, question I got from two neighbors, one on Bridal Spur Road and one on the Locust <coughs> Extension. 
uh, and this may be a question for the clerk, is Connors Farm is about to uh, engage in its the, the, the corn maze and the activities they have around the fall. Um, and I do know that they engage bands. Does do they need a entertainment license uh, for outside bands or uh, things of that nature? Mr. Chairman, I can recall back a number of years ago uh, when that was first developing, um, and now it's much larger uh, uh, venture up there. Uh, they we check as far as entertainment goes, and it was exempt because of the agricultural preservation, not the agricultural preservation, but the agricultural nature of the event and the supporting agriculture on the farm, the operation of the farm. So the answer is they are not permitted by our office at all. Uh, okay. Um, I've also heard that there's fireworks up there. I, was, I do not know that to be a case. I've heard that from one neighbor and asked them to, could you please confirm that that was the fact, um, would that be covered under the agricultural status that they engage in if, if in fact that were happening? That, that could be a good, is a good question, um, but I believe fireworks displays are permitted through the state and maybe the individual fire department of the, of the city and town where these occur, but I, I don't have any further knowledge on that. So I guess I would ask the town manager, could you have someone reach out to the corners and find out if in fact they did, and I'm not suggesting they did, other than the fact that it was reported by a resident. Um, of course, we know that there are other uh, areas that do have the fireworks displays, not in town. I don't want, I don't want to, I'm not looking to uh, uh, penalize corners if they didn't have any activity in that, in that regard, but if they did, um, could we find out what the appropriate process would be to make sure that they follow it? But on the heels of the question about entertainment at in an agricultural location, maybe this transcends. Um, is there a point at which the um, activities have to end in the evening? Uh, this neighbor complained that the bands went on well past 11 o'clock. They tried contacting the owner with little result. Um, so is there a uh, time at which we we would want that to end. I don't know if, the, I don't think we have a noise ordinance bylaw that says start at a certain time, end at a certain time. Do we, Mr. Clark? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, occasionally we get calls regarding neighborhoods that are uh, too loud, too long. Mm -hmm. uh, those are always generally referred to the police department for, um, for their determination as to whether they are deemed a nuisance. Okay. So I should uh, let these two neighbors know that if they feel it is a nuisance, they should contact the police department. All right. Uh, those are the comments I got that I said I would pass along. I um, have no other uh, new business uh, or closing comments. Um, and so I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Clark before I move on. Did you want to say something about oh, that? I can't forget. Yeah, we have a little event coming up in yeah. Topsfield in a couple of days. In fact, I, we had a meeting tonight uh, before the Topsfield Fair, and I was amazed how many vendors are already up there getting their food booths in and stuff. But um, among the, the highlights are going to be Mr. Trask is going to be opening for Chubby Checker on Wednesday night. He keeps reminding us up there. He's on a trine on stage at, what, 5 o'clock? Mm -hmm. uh, Chubby Checker's on a real stage at 7 o'clock. Uh, we also have um, people such as um, Charlie Daniels Band, Sarah Evans, and our big Big, big uh, concert is going to be Martina McBride on the uh, Saturday evening in the arena. Uh, this is our 200th anniversary. We are the oldest continuously operating fair in America, and we take great pride in that. And we've gone to great extent and great expense trying to get all kinds of interesting activities for this week, uh, for that week, it's from uh, September 28th until uh, Columbus Day, October 8th. We have a big parking lot up there with the town view, uh, Fairview Farm on Route 1, and we're also parking on the weekends at North Shore Community College. Uh, we are not parking at Masconoma this year, so we have two off-site off parking lots as well to accommodate the crowds. We hope some good weather. We hope people will come in and support it. We have spent a tremendous amount of money so far with this fair. We've got a highlight as one of it is a book we've had written by Yankee Magazine that's 160 pages of history of the fair. 
and we brought out all kinds of artifacts uh, from the fair. And there's going to be a big ceremony on Saturday for the Pickering family. Uh, Timothy Pickering is kind of unique in the history of America. He was President Washington's, he had three cabinet positions during his tenure in Washington, D.C., and he was the first president of the fair for 20 years back in the 18 teens, 20s, and 30s. And his family is coming up from all over the country for a, a plaque that we're going to be putting in, in memory of all the original 18 people that started the Essex Agricultural Society back in 1818. Um, Any relation to the cobbler? The dam excuse me? Is he related to the Danvers cobbler? Pickering? Yeah. No, he's related. He's a, he's a forefather. Oh, Piccolo, I'm thinking. No, that's I'm Piccolo. You know, this, this is Pickering that had his, his descendants had Pickering fuel down in Salem, and he was a big farmer in Hamilton, Wenham, and um, he was Washington, D.C., I mean, Was George Washington's um, Secretary of State and, I believe, uh, Secretary of War in one other position during the period of the Washington administration. Mm -hmm. He was uh, one of the Federalists that were kind of put out of, uh, put out the pasture by Thomas Jefferson when the Virginia people took over around 1800, but he was very important in the early history of the country. Um, interesting times, a lot of activities for a lot of people, and there's going to be about 40 other entertaining groups like Mr. Trask uh, entertaining throughout the fairgrounds throughout the week, and we've gone to a great extent to get those people uh, a different, diverse kind of group of people for all age groups. So we welcome you there. We're going to also have a, a hot dog eating contest if anyone wants to try that. That, that sounds kind of gross, but the uh, B'nai Breath is sponsoring that, and they're going to have a preliminary round one weekend and the finals the next weekend. And I can imagine what it's going to be like, but it's a, they're going to be Kayim hot dogs, kosher hot dogs, so everyone can eat them. Okay, I don't know. Thank you very much for the opportunity. What's the name of the book? You said it, yeah. The book is the history of, it's the history of the Tuscal Fair. That's the name it's of it? It's available for $35. It's for sale at the fairgrounds. You can get advanced tickets. You can buy it with the advanced tickets, or it'll be available during the fair. And we've actually, it's quite interesting, the general manager is saying that we're selling quite a few of the books already because it's got quite a history. I think that's a good book. And it's, it's really interesting. A lot of, a lot of photographs. And uh, the, the guy who, who's the uh, owner of Yankee Magazine made a real major effort with this and a commitment of staffing uh, of their people. And um, we had a woman almost full time for the last year working on the book and the history of it. And but just by the interesting note, the Damas Archival Center had over 200 volumes of material related to the fair, mm -hmm. and we found over 800,000 pages of information between UMass, uh, Amherst, the, De the Historical Society, the, um, the PBS Museum, and all kinds of other places. It's very well documented because up until the Civil War time, the fair was the conduit of information for the farmers in Essex County. They did all kinds of experimentation. Brought ma uh, they brought um, worms to this country trying to make silk. They brought merino sheep here to try to make wool. All kinds of things that were done back before there was a Department of Agriculture. Interesting to some people. I like reading that stuff. Great. I, I want to give you your opportunity Thank to you, sir. show <laughs> before I, I appreciate turn over that. to Selection Bennett. Well, I do have a couple of things to bring to your attention. Um, the gas explosion up in uh, Middle S Middlesex Valley. Um, Debbie's treasure chest in Lawrence is collecting supplies tomorrow and also looking for folks to help sort the supplies. I know some of the Qantas clubs up in uh, the valley are going to help out up there tomorrow. So if you have some supplies you can drop off, that would be great. Um, Saturday is the Kiwanis Duck Race down at Pope's Landing. The ducks go in the water at 1130. Come down a little early and buy your ducks and uh, hopefully you'll win one of the prizes. And that money is used to support a grant program for graduating seniors that live in Danvers. Um, they could be at NASCO, they could be at the prep or Danvers side. As long as they reside in Danvers, they're eligible to apply for these grants. And I think we gave out $15,000 last year with the help of Ira Toyota which supplied two $2,500 grants uh, for our program. So that's my new business. And is there anything else, nope, Mr. Treston? Um, certainly, by all means, remember the veterans. Uh, we had 9-11 last week. I know everybody participated in a lot of events around the North Shore and elsewhere. Um, but it's important to remember our first responders as well. And certainly those first responders responded this last weekend up in um, Merrimack Valley. 
So think of your first responders and your veterans. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will entertain a motion to. Uh, so moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, Danvers. Good night. Good night, David. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you.